Friends, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be with you all this morning and to share some thoughts on the coming budget in the context of the recent uh, developments. So the budget this year has been advanced by one month. Uh, this has certain advantages and certain disadvantages. Uh, the advantage is that the budget could be passed before the end of the fiscal year so that expenditures can begin to flow according to the allocations mentioned in the budget right from the beginning. Uh, this will have a salutary effect on the expenditure flow during the year and is therefore welcome. But at the same time, it has a disadvantage that we do not have enough data to go by, even for estimates of income in the current year or the uh, collection of revenues during the year. And therefore, all of that is to be made upon certain assumptions. And it also becomes more difficult uh, to project uh, what the income and therefore the revenues will be in the coming fiscal. So there are advantages and disadvantages in advancing the, the budget by a month. But I must say, these are inherent difficulties in all <coughs> parliamentary democracies, where the budget has to be presented before the end of the fiscal year and the approval will have to come as early as possible so that uh, the revenues and expend or the expenditures particularly can flow in an even way. But added to all these problems has been the uncertainties that have been created by the recent decision uh, to put it in a legal fashion, the withdrawal of the legal tender in relation to selected bank notes the short term for it is the demonetization. Now, demonetization as a subject has been discussed threadbare by now. Of course, demonetization is suggested always as one of the measures that could be taken to neutralize the unaccounted income or the black money, as people call it, held in the form of cash. Obviously, demonetization cannot be a yeah. standalone measure. The limitations of demonetization are very clear. It tries to attack the existing stock of unaccounted income and that too only in the form of cash. It does not actually do anything about further accumulation of the uh, black money or unaccounted uh, income. Therefore, to prevent further accumulation would be measures such as improved transparency and lesser discretion in governance, um, revised tax structure, improved tax administration, and last but not the least, um, the changes in the funding of the political parties and so on. As was mentioned, this is not the first time that demonetization has been attempted, even in India. Uh, this is the third occasion. But the demonetization measure this time is far deeper because of the substantial amount of currency that has been um, uh, being taken out of circulation. The shortage of currency, the new currency, to supply the old currency has caused a lot of problems. I think one has to recognize very clearly the fact that this has led to a lot of suffering on the part of wage earners, daily wage earners, vegetable vendors, retail trade at a, at a very small level, and so on. The pain is real. And there are possibly advantages in the long term, uh, such as a cleaner system, maybe, 
and um, um, a system which uses less cash. And perhaps some of the sectors like real estate, which are cash driven, may, may have to modify their thing. But these are all in the future. And they depend upon a number of other factors. But as I said, the pain is real as of now. It is tangible and immediate. And the sooner we get over these uh, disturbances and the distortions that have been created, the better for the, the economy. <coughs> I will go on against this background to say a few words on what I think could be done in the budget and what could be the focus in the, in the, in the, in the budget. Every budget is influenced by what the economists call the initial conditions, and that is the state of the economy as it stands now. What is the state of the Indian economy? We all had seen only a few days ago uh, the Central Statistical Office releasing the data on national income. The GDP growth, which was 7.6% in 2015-16, is expected to grow at 7.1% in 2016-17. And I prefer to look at the GVA, at the basic prices, because that is much closer to what we used to look earlier, the GDP at factor cost. And that goes down from 7.2 to 7%. The only two sectors which goes a greater growth rate than previous year is agriculture, which grows, which is expected to grow at 4.1%, and public administration at 12.8%. What do we make out of this? These numbers clearly say, even without taking into account the disruptions caused by demonetization, the economy has slowed down. I think that is the one thing that emerges. And once you take into account the disruptions caused by demonetization, where will it be? One doesn't have a clear estimate for that. But therefore, I, I would really think that we are looking to an economic growth somewhere around between 6 and 6.5% for the year as a, as a whole. Um, maybe it is 65 or it could be better depending upon um, how long this disruptions, uh, disruptions continue. But one thing that is really striking when you look at the numbers is that the gross fixed capital formation rate has fallen from 29.3% to 26.6%. I think this is the actually seal. Investment is not picking up. And all of you here, most of you know it by your own experience. And I think the private investment and the corporate investment are well below what they used to be. And the slowdown in investment has an impact on future growth, and that is critically important. So what emerges, the picture that emerges is, there has been a slowdown in economic growth, even without looking at the disruptions caused by the demonetization. So you will, that, those disruptions will have to be built into the calculations at a later point, and therefore, there is definitely a slowdown in growth. And I would also point out the fact that the decline in the investment rate is a critical factor which will affect the economic growth. And that is something on which the, the budget will have to focus. The stability parameters are reasonably in good shape. The three stability parameters are one with respect to inflation, the second with respect to fiscal deficit, and the third with respect to current account deficit. As you all know, both CPI and WPI are now in the region of somewhere between 3% and 3.6%. Um, uh, WPI is 3.2 and CPI is 3.6%. Both are at a, at a level which is well within tolerable limits. And going ahead, I have a feeling that the prices will remain uh, stable because one thing that has happened is that there's a pickup in agricultural production. 
and therefore food prices will continue to remain stable in the coming year. And therefore, my feeling is that as far as the inflation is concerned, it is under control and it will continue to remain under control. On fiscal deficit, 3.5 percent is the of the GDP is the target is the, the figure mentioned in the budget. Now, what will happen to the numerator and what will happen to the denominator? The denominator is the GDP at uh, market price in current prices. Now, the budget, when it was presented, projected a nominal income growth of 11% for the current year. The CSO has projected 11.7% as the nominal growth rate are during the current year. Now, this 11.7% will have to be adjusted because it does not take into account the disruptions caused by demonetization, and therefore it will be lower. But how much lower, we do not know. Perhaps the 11% nominal growth may still hold good. As far as the fiscal deficit in absolute amount is concerned, perhaps you are running on track. I mean, at least we have numbers up to the end of September, detailed prov prov provided by the controller of accounts, and they clearly indicate that both revenues and expenditures have been on track. The finance minister very recently, in a few days ago, uh, gave us numbers regarding uh, the growth rate in indirect taxes and direct taxes. He had given the numbers, direct taxes has grown about 15% and indirect taxes by 25%. Now, taking all of this into account, and also some decline in the next three months because of the disruptions caused by demonetization, I, it, it, is, it is perhaps that the fiscal deficit at 3.5% will hold during the, the current year. The third dimension is the BOP. Uh, this is not the occasion to talk a great deal about it, but let me only say that one thing that has been of concern to the people has been the decline, uh, has been the negative growth rate in exports. 2015-16 saw almost a decline in 15% in the export growth. But in the current year, uh, the growth rate is positive. In the last few months, it has been positive. And particularly, non-oil exports has picked up. The non-oil exports in April, November is about 1.8%. And another thing is that international prices have fallen. And therefore, if you look at it in volume terms, the performance is a little better than what is indicated by value, uh, value terms. Uh, but the major factor contributing to the improvement in the balance of payments has been the reduction in the oil bill. And that has been very substantial. And therefore, the current account deficit last year was 1.1%. Uh, without elaborating into and giving you more details, uh, I think the current account deficit in the current year, that is 2016-17, will be perhaps 1% or even lower than that. Um, the uh, services are also doing reasonably well. And therefore, we should be in a position uh, to be able to uh, um, finance uh, the current account deficit um, easily. Uh, the fact is that during the current year, there have been two factors which have had uh, the effect of reducing the capital flows. Uh, one is the outflow in the portfolio investment after the rise in the, uh, after the raising of the rate of interest in uh, uh, the U.S. By, by the U.S. Fed and also the outflow from the NRI deposits uh, because of uh, the deposits which are taken under special conditions in 2013. But taking all of that into account, I, I believe that management of the current account deficit will be, um, will, will be done uh, very easily. Uh, going ahead in 2017-18, what will happen? It is very difficult to see what oil prices will be. Perhaps the, the declining phase has come to an end. You are only seeing the rising phase. But it has an effect both on the import side and on the export side. Please remember, export of petroleum products now constitute almost 20% of our total exports. The one weakness on the stability side is with respect to the banking system. The uh, gross non-performing assets uh, ratio has 
uh, has gone up to 9.1 percent for all scheduled commercial banks, as against 7.8 percent in March of this year, and the stress assets ratio has also gone up to 12.2 percent, and the um, non-performing assets ratio for the public sector banks is 11.8 percent. Now, what does that mean? It means a number of things. One, we need to bring in maybe additional capital. The other is the attitude of the banks towards lending. I think that's, that's the critical thing, because when the non-performing assets are at a high level, then the incentive to lend and also to lower the rate of interest comes down. So that is something that we need to look at, even though all the other factors seem to indicate yeah, perhaps a fall in the interest rate. It is really the high level of the non-performing assets might put the banking system under some kind of a stress. Uh, having said all of this, I think very briefly let me say what should the budget then look at and what should the budget do? Obviously, it is very clear that uh, the, uh, the task is to reduce the uncertainty uh, that has been caused by the monetization, demonetization measure and bring it back, bring back normalcy as quickly as possible. And we need to stimulate growth. That is extremely important. But stimulating growth must be done without sacrificing the stability parameters. But fortunately, the stability parameters I talked about, the three important ones, are under control. And therefore, this gives, in my view, an opportunity for the government to be able to uh, be increase the expenditures, particularly the capital expenditures. But what should be the key question that people keep asking us is, according to the roadmap that was given regarding the fiscal deficit, we will go down from 3.5% to 3% in 2017-18. Should we do that? Or should we make a little change on that? Very often people talk whenever the fiscal deficit target is gained, that uh, those who argue for it are fundamentalists. I, let me want to clear one point. I think the maintenance of budget deficit at 3% of the GDP for the central government and 3% of the GDP for all state governments put together means the total fiscal deficit of the country is 6% of the GDP. It is far different from the 3% uh, under the Maastricht Treaty. What is under Maastricht Treaty is for all levels taken together in the European countries should be 3%. What we are really talking about is 6% of the GDP. Where did this 6% number come? Let me tell you, the way it was derived was that the economy can be divided into three groups. Government, corporate sector, households. Households in India include all non-corporate business also. In this, the household is the only surplus sector. Both government and the corporate sector are deficit sectors in the sense they draw on the savings of the household sector. The household sector's savings in financial assets is 11% of the GDP. It used to be. And therefore they said if 6% is taken away by the government, then the balance 5% will be available to the corporate sector, not only private, but also the public. Public sector undertakings are also there, will be available. In fact, as you all know, uh, we, we do not know what is happening in the current year, but until last year, the household savings in the f financial assets has come down. The, grow, the net savings in the, uh, of the household sector in the financial assets is now 7.5%. The gross saving is somewhat higher because the way we derive the household sector savings in financial assets is gross saving in the financial assets, less liabilities. That is, private households also borrow. So deduct that and get the net. So if you go on increasing the fiscal deficit, then less will be available for the other part of the sector. You cannot say that let the government be relaxed and then expect at the same time that the private investment will pick up. Having said that, I, I will also make one other point. 
as of now, many people do not know that in the central budget, 46.7% of the tax revenue of the center goes in the form of interest payments. That is very nearly 50% of the tax revenue accruing to the center goes in the form of interest payments. Now, there must be some limit. Otherwise, people talk about higher development expenditure and so on and so forth. Therefore, there is need for fiscal prudence. There is need. In fact, I, I would only say that if there is no restriction on fiscal deficit, no condition, then what is the problem in budget making? Budget making is the easiest thing to do. You raise your, you set down your expenditures. This is the revenue, the, the rest will, I will borrow. There is some limit or restriction there. But having said that, should we really need to go from 3.5% to 3% as mandated? I do not know what the NKC committee is going to say. I am not privy to it, even though I talk to them. Therefore, I, I would think perhaps it could be anywhere between 3 and 3.5%. I mean, I think one need not necessarily push it down to some level that we have prescribed before. Because at the present moment, I recognize that there is a need to fill the gap that has been developed in the system and therefore government expenditures should increase and more particularly capital expenditures. But I must also say, very often people who argue for a relaxation of the fiscal deficit say, well, capital expenditures are increasing and therefore it must be done. But that is not always a reason. Look at last year. The reason for higher fiscal deficit was because of the consumption expenditure, increase in the salaries and the emoluments. It is not because of capital expenditure. Therefore, I believe that, yes, there could be a slight pause, even with respect to fiscal deficit, but that must be directed towards capital expenditure. Let me conclude very briefly, indicating a few things. Therefore, accelerating the growth is, in my view, an important aspect of, uh, should be a, the important focus of the budget. Uh, the sentiment has been weak. Maybe the, the reform agenda has to be tightened and pushed forward. But as I said, the increase in the capital expenditures of the government is extremely important. But here again, I want to point out one thing. Total public investment is 7% of GDP. When I say public investment, it is investment by or capital expenditures by central government, state government, and public sector enterprises. Capital expenditures of the central government in the budget constitute only 1.6% of the GDP. Perhaps another 1.6% will come from state governments. The balance comes from public sector enterprises. That is why I have always been pleading that the government, when it presents the budget, give a comprehensive picture of the capital expenditures to be incurred, not only by the central government, but also by the public sector enterprises. If this 7% of the GDP as capital expenditures by government and public enterprises can be increased by another 1%, I think that will be a significant contribution. Because much of the expenditure, capital expenditures by the public investment is in the infrastructure sector. But what about the corporate investment? I think that is what is lagging behind. Many studies have shown, I used to forecast capital expenditures using a particular method, that the Reserve Bank of India continues to do it, and then CMIE does it, and so on. All of that do indicate a substantial decline in corporate investment. And the reasons can be many. Um, and uh, the, in, in fact, as growth slows down, automatically the investment rate also goes up, goes down, because of what is called the acceleration principle in economics. The acceleration principle says investment is a function of the increase in output. When there is an increase in output, you see an increase in demand, and therefore investment follows. So that is the acceleration principle. Therefore, when growth slows down, capital expenditures or investment comes down. Perhaps an improvement in the climate, improvement in the overall focus of the budget itself can provide a better climate for better corporate investment. Some of the reform items can do it. 
One thing that has been talked about is whether there should be a reduction in the corporate tax rate or not. Could be. That could be. Because it has been announced and perhaps it, that could be. But I want to be very categorical. Any reduction in the corporate tax rate must be accompanied by the removal of exemptions. I mean, without, without doing that, the removal, the reduction in the corporate tax rate is not justified. So the two must go together. Finally, I will briefly indicate what can be done in the tax structure. GST coming from on 1st April, to me, looks very remote. Um, it, is, it has taken a long time. Some significant forward steps were made during the current year, uh, but there are still some difficulties to be ironed out. Perhaps it will. But in a paper Govinda Rao and I had written some time ago, uh, we had argued that since it is so time consuming to get all the states on board, at least the government of India must look at its indirect tax structure and modify it in such a way that it is in tune with the emerging GST structure. Today, you look at the government of India's indirect tax structure. There are some which are ad valorum. There are some which are uh, specific. And there are innumerable number of slabs in the tax rates also. So I would really suggest that in this budget, the government of India should really revise the indirect tax structure to bring it in close alignment with the expected GST structure that will emerge. I think that is important. The, some time ago, the securities transaction was imposed and the capital gains taxation was modified accordingly. I think it's time to go back and see whether we can um, abolish the securities transaction tax and do something about the capital gains taxation. Finally, one word on the expenditure side. I mentioned about the improvement in the, um, uh, the, the, the increase in the capital expenditures. One other thought that I understand is being going around is the idea of providing a basic income to everybody. As an idea, it's, it's good because it does away with many other intermediaries and provides directly to the people. But the country and the society has gotten used to number of subsidies a number of concessions. I had looked at the numbers. The numbers are that the, all the subsidies taken together, food, um, fertilizer, and petroleum, comes to about, I mean, I'm giving in round numbers, it's not precise, some two lakh crores. And there are various other, Indra, Vazi, so many other things. If you add up all of that, it will come to another 80,000 crores. So it's the 2,80,000 crores. But if we have to provide at least 1,000 rupees per person, now that, where does that 1,000 rupee come? I think that's uh, uh, that number. For example, our own Committee on Poverty estimated the poverty ratio at 972 rupees for rural areas and 1,400 rupees in the urban areas. Now, if you take an average of 1,000 for easy calculation, even if you have to provide for 30 crore of people, it requires something like 3.6 lakh crores. Now, the problem with giving it only to 30 crores of people is, once again, you have to identify the people. The same problem will come back. When people talk about basic income uh, scheme, People talk of universal basic income scheme, so that everybody gets it. And maybe like what was done with respect to gas, you can say, please return. Though all those who are ha having an income above, please return. But otherwise, you have to get into the problem of identifying the people and so on. So I think the idea of moving towards a basic income is, uh, is a good one. But I think um, a lot more of thinking and a discussion is required because many people who are now enjoying the subsidies will be unwilling to, to do it. Therefore, let me conclude, let me sum up by saying 
that the distortions caused by the demonetization uh, linger on and uh, the gains are in the future. Um, therefore, I think we need to uh, ensure that normalcy returns as early as possible. Growth as of now has slowed down and therefore the primary objective of the budget must be to accelerate growth as the stability parameters are likely to be under control. A greater emphasis on expanding capital expenditures by the government and supplemented by investment of public sector enterprises will be needed. Any relaxation in corporate tax rate must be accompanied by the removal of exemptions. The indirect tax structure at the center needs to be revamped to be in conformity with the emerging GST structure. Any measures such as basic income will need extensive consultation and creating a consensus on the withdrawal of existing subsidies. These are some of my thoughts and thank you very much.